Hello and welcome to the channel. Recently I reviewed Quads Z2 or Z2 Hi-Fi speakers and after the review the speaker's designer Peter Como contacted me with some extra information and also an invitation. So I travelled to Huntington here in the UK to go to IAG's UK Centre of Operations to meet the man himself. <music> For the viewers, obviously, that might not know, who are IAG and what is your role for them? Um, IAG is the parent company for uh, a, a lot of very well-known hi-fi brands like Wharfdale, Mission, Quad, uh, Audiolab and Leak. And uh, I am the head of acoustic design. So I do all the speaker design work, um, obviously leading a team of engineers, but you know, I make sure that I do all the listening and keep overall control of what goes on. Um, and I'm also occasionally used as a, a bit of a golden ear when it comes to electronics design as well. So in terms of the speakers that you've designed, some that the viewers are probably very familiar with, the Wharfdale Lintons that you can see behind us, and obviously the Evo range that you can't see on camera that's sitting over there. But what about maybe some speakers from yesteryear that you might have designed that maybe the viewers will, will know or maybe owned? Well, I started off in 1979 when together with a friend I formed Haybrook. Our first speaker was the HB2. Um, that was very successful but not as successful as its follow-up the HB1 which won three Watt Hi-Fi awards um, for best loudspeaker three years running which is at the time was something of a record. And then I repeated that record actually later on when I joined Mission um, towards the end of the um, the 90s, with the Mission 780, um, again winning three Watt Hi-Fi Awards. When you're designing a speaker, what would you say is the most important thing, or I suppose the thing that you prioritise the most? Playing music. <laughs> no, I mean, that makes it sound simple, but actually it's very difficult to get a very enjoyable sound out of a loudspeaker that, that relates to the music that you're playing. Um, you can, there are two ways I think of, of designing. You can either go all out for what is an impressive sound, one that basically blows somebody away the first time they hear it, but over time they may get tired of it. It might have a boomy bass, a piercing treble, uh, a mid-range that takes your head off um, with say opera singers. That's no good in, in my book. You really want a speaker that when you sit down you just want to keep on playing music. And that's what I aim for. If a speaker design does not start to achieve that as I'm going through the design process, then I'll literally cut it and go away and design something different. So in terms of you know, designing speakers for that long, where, where does inspiration come from? Where do you get new ideas? Um, there are always new processes coming up, new materials. You'll get some people who say, oh, speakers haven't really changed for the past 30 odd years um, because you, know, you look at the outside of a box and you've still got, a, a, a wooden, in many cases, a wooden box with some drive units in front of it. But what people don't realise is that the materials that make up the speaker um, have improved, as have our techniques, um, as I was showing you earlier, Terry, of designing the crossover so we can now more accurately map the acoustic slopes of the crossover to blend the drive units better. We're not only learning all the time how to make um, our use of materials better, but also there are new materials coming forward um, that enable us, for example, to, to, to build better base units. So, so really you're inspired by performance, really, to try and achieve better performance. I do think that it's incredible that we can now put together a hi-fi system where you can be practically convinced if you close your eyes that somebody's in front of you is singing. Um, that I think is a huge advance over what was available even when I was growing up in the 60s. It's fair, that is the magic for me of high-end audio. It's the, when, when you not even, even close your eyes as such, but you, you can hear things, but you can kind of see them happening in front of you as well. To me, that's, yeah. that's the magic of it. And based on what we were just talking about there, there's a really interesting speaker behind us, which I don't want to talk about too much, but that is what you, we was doing an AB demonstration of before where mm. you've exactly done exactly the same thing, isn't it? Take, taking a traditional speaker, one that's very dear to you personally, 
and advanced it with modern technology and thinking to improve its performance. Yeah, the Mission 770, um, which you can see next to the Lintons behind us, that project grew out of us wanting to do something for Mission, um, which was uh, exciting in this day and age, but also was a little bit retro because we know that people we know from something like the Lintons, for example, that people are very interested in that. So in 1978, I was still a journalist. I was writing for Hi-Fi Answers magazines, Hi-Fi News magazines, and so on. And the the speaker which set my world alight in 1978 was the Mission 770. I heard prototypes of it. I was in on the on some of the development of it, not actively, I have to say, but as a journalist, listening to prototypes. Um, and I really enjoyed the fact that here at last was a speaker that was not designed on purely engineering terms, but was designed with an engineering background, but with an ear for, for delivering a musical performance. So I wanted to recapture that, but with the techniques that we've got now and the materials we've got now of actually going one better and bringing it right up to date. Well, what's interesting that the AB demonstration that we did was between the Linters, wasn't it, and, mm -hmm. and the new Mission 707s. And I think from listening to them here, obviously they're in slightly different positions in the room, but listening to the difference between them, I, f I can confidently say that if you own Lintons and you might be considering an upgrade, that would be a speaker to consider in terms of you know, better performance from the same kind of physical form factor, which is, you know... The wife might not even notice type situation. As long as you keep the grills on, she might not notice. <laughs> yeah, I think she would notice it once you take the grills off. But, uh, but yes, they are similar sized speakers, yeah, but yeah. as you heard, they do yeah. very different things. Yeah. Really, I think, encapsulates something which I'm often asked is, is how do I design for different brands? Um, I've grown up with a lot of these brands from the 50s right through um, uh, uh, until the 90s. And I got a feel very early on for, let's say, what the Wharfdale typical characteristic sound was, what the mission sound was. Obviously, working at mission, I, I quickly, quickly came to, came to know that. Um, what the quad sound was as well. So each of these brands has their own character. And that might seem surprising because, as I've shown you, when we measure them all, they all measure very similarly, but they all sound very different. And that sound makeup, the difference between them, the different characters of the brands, um, comes through, I think, if you if you manage the design carefully as, as I did through listening as I try to do. Um, so the Lintons have a typical Wharfdale, if I can say, richness to them. They're very full, they're very rounded, but they still give you the musical detail that, that you want. Whereas the Mission 770 is much more of a monitor speaker. Um, in a typical mission class, the mission character was all for um, giving you something which is very lively, very explicit, very dynamic, um, to the point where you can hear exactly how something's been recorded in the studio. Now, for some people, that might seem a bit much that, you know, you can hear almost like moving the faders up and down in the studio as they're mixing things in and out. Um, but for others, they will relish, as you said, that ability to be able to hear in space everything that's, that's yeah. going on. In terms of creating a hi-fi system sound synergy, how, how, does, how does a speaker designer go about trying to put a speaker together that they think maybe can work with, with certain amplifiers? In, in a sense, you have a bit of an advantage because part of IAG is Audio Lab, and so that gives you an advantage in terms of pairings. But how does a designer go about that? Is, is that even a process or a thought process? Um, it can be a process. Um, I have to say, I see a lot of designs, especially very high-end loudspeakers, where the designer has just not bothered. Uh, and speakers which, say, drop down to one ohm or less active impedance are going to require practically unbustable amplifiers to drive them. They're going to give them a really hard time. Personally, I don't believe in that. Um, I don't see why, first of all, why you have to design a speaker like that. And secondly, you're always going to get better performance from a loudspeaker if the amplifier is working well within its limits. So even if we take, uh, say, the quad amplifier, um, 250 watt monoblocks, uh, if they're coasting along at a, at, a, at a few watts, they're still going to give a better sound into a loudspeaker which is never dropping, say, below three and a half ohms. 
than they are into something which which goes down ridiculously low. Um, so I and the other thing that people I think don't understand about impedance is that the impedance is never the same as you go through the frequency range. So it goes up and down and up and down. Um, and as it goes up and down, the phase angle of the impedance changes, because we're not just talking about resistance, we're also talking about inductance and capacitance. So it moves from an inductive area to a capacitive area. When it does that, there's a shift in the way the amplifier has to deliver voltage and current. Basically, they go in and out of sync. And when that happens, the strain on the amplifier is very big. So I try to aim for a very smooth impedance curve, which doesn't deviate too much from what we regard as the, you know, the, the target impedance. Um, so if we, if we look at the Linton, um, it's a three-way speaker. It wants to be as sensitive as possible, so we're aiming at 90 decibels for one watt, which is great because it means you don't have to use super powerful amplifiers to get the best out of them. Um, but on the other hand, in order to get that sensitivity, I had to drop the impedance down to to, four, to a 4 ohm nominal load. Now, for a lot of the time, it's well above 4 ohms. Um, it rises up above, above 10 ohms um, throughout the mid-band. So we feel confident in talking about it as what we could term as an 8 ohm compatible speaker. But in terms of the minimum, it's dropping down to around 4 ohms as an absolute minimum. And that's fine for modern amplifiers. When we look at the Mission 770, as it's a classic, that was originally designed as an 8 ohm loudspeaker. Wants to keep it as an 8 ohm loudspeaker. Yes, we'll trade off some sensitivity for that. But the trade off means that it's even easier to drive. And if it's used, say, with valve amplifiers, which are very critical of the impedance they drive, it's a very easy load. So in terms of maybe designing different speakers for different people, I can imagine that must be probably the hardest thing, especially when you're maybe designing for different brands as well. Mm. Is it more difficult to design a speaker with a maybe a more budget profile in terms of, a, of cost? Or is it more difficult actually to go all in, uh, no compromise? You know, I can imagine the challenges are different because the expectations maybe are a little different. So mm. what is easier, what is more difficult? I know it might seem the other way around, but the budget speaker is more difficult. Yeah. Um, to make a speaker affordable, you're obviously dealing with, with cheaper materials, um, which do not respond quite the way that you would want them to. So you know, it's a little bit more distortion and coloration creeps in than, than you would ideally like. But then you're not obviously within budget constraints. You can't deal with ideals. You're dealing with what can we do at this price. Uh, the other problem is that you know that they're going to be partnered with cheaper amplifiers which may not have very robust power supplies, may have output stages which react to difficult loads. So you're trying to juggle all these factors, as well as usually dealing with quite a small form factor. So you've got small cabinets, small drive units, and so on. Um, so they're actually a little bit more difficult. Let, let me just quickly talk about the process then, because you've shown me around the facility here. There's a little uh, anechoic chamber, yeah. another bits and pieces. So how does a product go from conception to you know being on a hi-fi rack in someone's listening room? When I first started making speakers, it was usually let's, uh, let's just put, a, put together a cabinet and some drive units which work together well. Um, and you never worried too much about how it looked because... In the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, people were more interested in the performance of something than they were in the looks of it. These days, it's the other way around. People buy with their eyes before their ears. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and I don't blame them, because at the end of the day, you've got a pair of speakers which are going to sit in your home as a piece of furniture. So why not make it look absolutely gorgeous? Um, and to a certain extent, the classic design of the Lintons has shown that is what people want. They do want a piece of furniture in their home. You know, this beautiful veneered wood, um, the black cloth grill, it, it all helps to, to integrate in, in, into the room as pieces of furniture. So we will nowadays, we, will, we, we know what the drive units can do. We know the cabinet volumes we want, that's fine. But we then give that to the ID designer and say, come up with something um, that you think will fit what people want. And um, he will come up with 
probably about 10 designs which we then refine and maneuver and sometimes you'll come up with some things which don't work acoustically so I'll have to tell them off about that um, but in the in the end we end up with something that, that looks great and we know will sell um, and then it's handed over to me to start you know putting in the drive units um, making sure that the cabinet works the way that it should uh, getting rid of all the distortions all the colorations panel resonances um, making sure that the cones work the way they should and then the motor systems so, um, so uh, for instance on, on the 770 one of the advances over the original speaker is that we use copper in the voice coil gap in order to reduce inductance and linearize the magnetic performance so all that sort of thing has to go on and I mean that takes a long time yeah. You know, we're, we're looking at over a year development time just to do that alone. And how much of that development time is sitting and listening to the product? Well, that is just purely the engineering side. And after that, I then start working on crossovers. And when I start working on crossovers, you can be looking at another six months. Or in the case of the Mission 770, as I showed you, we're up to version 174. That means I've made 174 crossovers, all of which measured great, but they all sounded different yeah. until I was satisfied I got the one, which makes the speaker really sing. So you might see 173 on eBay, is that right? No, no <laughs> never. never. <laughs> Obviously, measurements are really important, but are they important? What measurements are important? How should they be used? How can they be used? And how do you feel about measurements for, specifically for speakers? Measurement for me is a, is a tool um, which I use to find out how the various components of the speaker are performing and responding. And I'll then use those measurements in order to be able to refine those components. And here we can start off talking about materials and how we can use measurements to improve your use of materials. Um, and then when it comes down to crossover work, uh, it really is an iteration between three things. So start off with measurement. That measurement, those measurements of the individual drive units go into a software program, which will give me a starting crossover. And that starting crossover um, is, is based upon getting an even frequency response. Not a flat frequency response, but even frequency response. Then I will go and listen and try and hear what's right and what's wrong about it. And what's right is as, is as much is as important as what's wrong. Yeah. Then, um, based upon what I've heard that's wrong, we'll go back and maybe do some more measurements, but certainly do some more work in the software in order to try and correct that. And what we end up with is something which is totally based on listening. In fact, I will very often, I'll, I'll um, come up with a crossover totally based on listening, which I'll then go and measure, and it measures absolutely superbly, and I astonish myself because I didn't expect it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Although the measurement will show you um, whether, the, whether the designer of the speaker is talented enough to get a reasonably good balance across the, across the frequency range, it doesn't tell you what the sound of the speaker is like. And I think we've proved that today, mm -hmm that the Lintons and the Mission 770s, they measure almost identically, but they sound totally, totally different. For the 174 variations of the Mission mm. speakers behind us, just mm. as an example, what are you actually changing in order to make a difference? And I suppose, what differences are you listening for? What I'm listening for, again, is to try and get away from the fact that it's, a, in the case of the 770, it's a two-way loudspeaker. You know, I don't want to hear the bass unit and the treble unit working separately. I want it to be blended so seamlessly that you can't hear the speaker at all. You shouldn't, when, you should be able to close your eyes and the speakers disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, that's, you can do that with modern hi-fi, yeah. that, that should be the aim. That's part of what I'm listening for. The other is, can I hear all the detail? Can I hear every single instrument in the orchestra? Can I hear all the mixes that Billie Eilish has, has done in the studio <laughs> in order to get the amazing sounds that you know, her and her producers produce? Um, can I hear the rasp of a Moog synthesizer or, or a sequential Prophet 5? Uh, you know, can I hear the shimmer on a pair of Zidran cymbals? Uh, it, it's all that sort of thing that, that you listen out for, but you don't listen out for it uh, intently. You're listening as part of the music. So, because music is, is 
composed obviously of the melody, the notes, the accompaniment, but it's not pure tones, is it? Every instrument has its own range of harmonics. So getting the harmonic balance right is as important as getting the fundamentals right. So Peter, we were briefly talking about some of the speakers that you've designed previously or in the past, and you've got one of them here to tell us about. And I don't recognise it, so what speaker is that? Uh, so this is a Mission 780, um, which I designed uh, just previous to the millennium. And uh, this was a, my first major design for, for Mission and won the Watt Hi-Fi Award for Best Loudspeakers three years running. So I repeated the same objective that, that I did with the Haybrick HB1, and this went on to sell, well, hundreds of thousands of, of, of units. It was a really, really popular speaker. Can we take the crew off and yeah. tell us about the design? And what, yeah. what made this one stand out, do you think, at the time? Uh, the um, original cone um, was very advanced cone material, which was very stiff, very lightweight, had very good bandwidth, very good control of resonance. Um, as you can see, fixed phase plug in the center, which was fairly innovative at the time, I think. Um, that controls the mid-range the, the, the mid -range performance as it crosses over to the treble unit. Um, the treble unit itself, classic Mission Silk Dome, nothing new there except that in this case it is supported on a foam buffer which reduces the vibration from the cabinet through to the, um, the treble dome. Um, the cabinet itself is a work of art. If I can't show you inside, but if I could, you see that it's actually sculpted um, like a work of art in order to both break up panel resonance and also increase the internal volume of the cabinet as much as possible. Um, and again, you know, a crossover which took into account the acoustic performance of the drive units and really blended everything together in a, in a lovely way. Can I ask something that's probably a little bit simple? Why is it upside down? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this was a this was a mission trademark, if you'd like, trademark part of the design, um, which started in I think about nineteen eighty one, something like that, uh, where Mission brought out the seven hundred. Apologies if I got that date wrong. But I'm relying on memory. Um, Mission brought out the seven hundred where the design, which was done, I believe, by Henry Azima. Um, was to uh, try and maximise the crossover where there were relatively equal path lengths between the base unit and the treble unit. So if you think about it, having a base unit at the top um, firing directly at your ears, the path for the treble unit is actually at an angle and therefore it takes a little bit longer for the treble to meet that of the base unit. But if you look at it from the side, the treble unit is obviously on the front the main output of the base unit is behind it. Mm -hmm. So by using this inverted arrangement, we can equalize the path lengths from, from the drivers. We've spoken quite a few times about this, the Mission 770 speaker, but it's an interesting speaker because of the manufacturing of it, which is going to be all here in the UK. Is that correct? It is indeed, yes. Um, the the there are two reasons for this. One is we wanted to open up the UK as a manufacturing centre again because we are selling now a lot, not just the UK, but also to Europe and, and America. It's lovely to be able to you know, put this together um, on the premises and have a fully constructed British loudspeaker. I've got to be honest, now I'm close to it and actually looking at it, it's hard to take your eyes off it, actually. It's a really interesting looking at the tweeter. It's a really interesting... Yeah, I might take these ones home with me, <laughs> if that's OK. <laughs> Peter, it's been absolutely fascinating visiting you here today and looking around the facility, discussing things with you. Thank you very much for explaining things to me in a little bit more detail in terms of design, measurements and other bits and pieces. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'd love to come back another time and maybe look at some other things. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful and helpful. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already of course you have and i'll see you soon thanks very much again peter thank you thank you thank you